Um, I want to ask you about Leonard. So there's a, a love triangle here. Madeline, of course, is the main character, and Leonard is in love with her and she with him. And then there's a third boy that we'll talk about later, Mitchell, who is madly in love with Madeline and she not with him. But Leonard, uh, this wonderful character that is manic depressive, I guess we'd call it bipolar now, but a, you know, a spectacular character. And although you say you don't read your reviews, I'm sure you've heard that people say that they think he's based on David Foster Wallace. Um, is he? Um, <laughs> he is not based on David Foster Wallace. He is, he is not based, he's based on a person I heard about and never met. And when I write a character, what I do is I think about the kind of person the character is, and then I think about everyone that I've ever met or heard about who might share those attributes. And then I pick and choose those attributes bestow them on the character, and then pour in a huge measure of my own self and me memories and, and even history to make the character begin to be alive, to be animated. So um, even though I didn't know David Foster Wallace well at all and only spent a week with him in, in my life, there are a couple things um, that, that, of Leonard's that, that might resemble him. The one that everyone thinks I took from from David Foster Wallace, which is the bandana, was actually not from him. It was from Axl Rose of Guns N' Roses. <laughs> I mean, it's more, more than one person wore a bandana. So, and, I, and Leonard is really into heavy metal, and, and that's yeah. why I gave him. But the, the way he sticks his, his chewing tobacco in his, in his boot, um, that is a David Wallace-like thing to do. Though the fact that he chews tobacco comes from my college roommates who were fanatical skull chewers. Ooh, yuck. Very big in, in 19... Was it? Yeah, very big. All my friends chewed tobacco back and then. And did you keep it in your boot? Was that the thing to do? No, that's the one thing that I saw Wallace would keep it in, in his sock or in his shoe. So a little thing like that has grown so out of control that they think I've based an entire... Well, and, and people get quite shirty about it, as you know, on the internet. You know, they're saying, well, why is he denying it? It's obvious that's who it is. So it's, you know, it's sort of out of your hands how could there now. Be, there's so many, how could I, I don't, even if I tried to write about him, I wouldn't be able to, and I would have created my, my own character because I, I didn't know him well enough. And I don't, but people will think what they think. Indeed. Uh, the other character, Mitchell Grammaticus, who uh, is of Greek descent and is from Detroit, so people might see a little bit more of a, of a connection to you in him. And I know that Mitchell has a few experiences that I know you have had. One is he goes on, a, he's on a spiritual quest of sorts, and he goes and he works in Calcutta with Mother mm -hmm. Teresa, as I believe you did. Can you well, talk actually, about that? Actually, Mitchell is based on David Foster Wallace. And that's, <laughs> that's why I've been resisting it so much. And, and Madeline is Jonathan first. Franzen, That's right. and no one under, no one, nobody gets it. It's amazing. Um, no, Mitchell, you know, I will plead guilty. M Mitchell does many of the things I did in college. I, I took a trip through Europe and made a, a spiritual pilgrimage of sorts to, to Mother Teresa. Um, and that part of the book, though the closest to my own life, was the hardest to write because I had my own memories competed with the fiction and I didn't know what to leave out. That's, mm. that, that's the problem with, with writing autobiographically, um, really autobiographically, and why I don't do it, is that you, you, your life is messy and, and has no shape to it, and things do not happen for dramatic reasons. So it's, it's difficult to find in that morass an actual fictional shape that, that, that is dramatic. Whereas if I write about someone um, whose life I don't, I, I'm just creating with, with no attachment to memory, I have an easier time um, envisioning them and finding, giving them something to do, the proper thing to do. How did you find working in, in Calcutta? Was it, a, I mean, obviously it would have been a life-changing experience, was it? Uh, it wasn't life-changing. I um, was there only for a brief period, but I, I wanted to, to see what my capacity for living a selfless, altruistic life was. And I, I had a, an easy time the first few days, and I started getting a little cocky, thinking this isn't so bad at all. And then I realized, um, you know, the weight of the actual work began to settle on me, and I started to think about what it would be like if every day for the rest of my life was spent taking care of these sick and, and dying men. And uh, I, I understood that that my capacity was not as gr as great as I thought. So I. I 
I fled from the place in a, with a real sharp feeling of, of failure, um, much, much as, as Mitchell does, but strangely also with a, a clearer sense of what I was going to do with my life. So it was a life-changing um, in a way, though that always connotes that it was a good, a good thing. But instead of becoming a saint, I just became a novelist. So obviously, <laughs> it was kind of downward. You came this close to being a That's saint. That's right. Um, Mitchell, fine, he's on a spiritual quest. And one of the great things about this book, and I think it's a real tribute to you, is that you treat Mitchell's quest for spirituality without any irony. I mean, you're, he's, you're quite straight ahead about what he's looking for, uh, and he reads Thomas Merton. I mean, all the characters in this book are affected immensely by the books they read, are they which, not? They are, and which yeah. is what I, when I think about college, it was such a bookish time. People were constantly talking about books, debating them, and every book you read might change your philosophy for at least a, a week or two until you re read the next book. So it was fun to, to write about that and to recall all the books that, that I read that I still remember, the ones that were, were very important to yeah. me. Well, it's one of the great things about college, isn't it? I mean, you're trying on new ideas all the time. You're discovering these ideas and just, just taking them for a ride, see how it goes. Yeah, and I, that's why I enjoyed writing these characters, because they're old, they're intellectually fully adult, and, and I, I, I could... I could write as, as intelligently as, as possible and, and, and be consistent with their, their minds. At the same time, they're very confused about who they are, and they're making some very, um, and sometimes alarming or dramatic decisions about their lives, which, which, is, which is good in a character, I think. I'm going to open the floor to questions in a minute. Let me just um, ask you one last thing, and this may not be your favorite question, but hey, um, nine years between, you seem to be hitting this nine-year mark between, between novels. Mm -hmm. Is that a function of how you write? I mean, do you just spend a long time writing novels? Or are you doing other things? How does that No, actually, I, I just wrote this book in about, uh, about a month um, <laughs> after eight years passed. The money was running low. That's I decided right, exactly. Gotta get and then done. you decided, what the hell, you'd put it out. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I started an, another book um, that turned into this book. So I lost about two or three years. Um, at the beginning, and I had to jettison that, and then I finally did have these characters, and and the marriage plot began. So I, this book took about five or six years, and um, at the same time, I wrote a book of short stories that is almost finished. So, so there'll be another Eugenides. There soon? will be, yes, re fairly soon. I have about one or two more stories to write on that, and there'll oh, be a collection. Oh, excellent. So, I remember um, when um, when Middlesex came out, one of the things you'd said about it was that it had been like building a house, and you had the three bedrooms all done, and then you thought, oh, how about a porch? And then, oh, maybe a family room. And, oh, why don't I just do the gazebo? Uh, this this was a more straight-ahead exercise for you, was it? I, I tend My ideas tend to grow. I mean, at first, this was going to be you know, a story about a, a little a little party someone was throwing, and I had these three characters, and then I took them out of that, and then I started thinking about the marriage plot idea, and then I made Madeline interested in 19th century literature. And then her boyfriend, who was actually going to be a fairly shadowy figure, became Leonard, and, and has a huge part to play in the book, and then I became interested in manic depression. And then Mitchell, who was just going to have a small part, developed this religious search. So it, it grew, it grew porches and, uh, and extra rooms. Um, it, it is a more, tightly dramatized book than, than Middlesex, but, but uh, you know, there's, there's space in which to live there. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. Um, I invite questions from the floor. There's a microphone there, you can line up. Um, while people are doing that, let me just ask you, did you, did you always want to be a writer? Like from the time you were 15 little? Or 15 or 16 years old, I decided. And you got, is, is the story true that you got fired from one of your, from your, I don't know if it was your first job, but you were writing Virgin Suicides on the sly? I was writing the Virgin Suicides at work. On, com <laughs> on company letterhead. On company letterhead. The, the, the Academy of American Poets. I would type, type out the top of a letter. Dear James Merrill, <laughs> we would like you to read in this year's reading festival. And then I would put a space bar and it would say, she came into the room. <laughs> The light was low, and then my boss caught me one too many times, and I was gone. And it was biscuits. Well, we have a yes. We have. We a have. Go ahead. Um, I first just wanted to thank you for coming here. Um, as you can tell, everyone loves you. I think I love you the most, but. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, my question is: Do you have one line in the book that's your favorite? 
it probably is the line I quoted that, that actually gave me the whole book, the, the one about the deconstructed love, which sounds like a song from the 80s, actually, <laughs> that, that Billy Idol should have sung. Thank you. Thank you. There's another. And there's also a line, the hardest thing about being religious is other religious people. I remember that. <laughs> That's another line. Go ahead. Hi. I was at Brown in the yes. early 80s myself. Yes. You're famous so. in my books. Hi. Hi. Did you know each other? That's the obscure object out there. <laughs> For real. Um, For real. Do you I, I do know. Well, can we, all right, you ask your question, then can you tell the story of the obscure object? I, I can if she won't blush to death. I'll Will tell you the blush story. to death? Aren't you dying to know what we're talking about? <laughs> It's Ask a, your question. It's a pretty good object. story. I know. So go ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Well, I can't look at you while I tell the story. <laughs> but don't speak. But the, the love interest in Middlesex is called the obscure object, and it came from the Louise Boonwell movie, that obscure object of desire. But but actually, it came from the fact that Rick Moody and I um, liked a girl at college who was very beautiful and who we didn't know very well, that we would see her walking around campus. And we started calling her the obscure object. And he would say, I saw the obscure object. And I would say, what was she doing? And he would say, she was in the library. And then I would see her and I would say, I saw the obscure object. And he would say, what was she doing? And I would say, she was eating a biscuit. <laughs> and it went on, went on like this. So then years later, that's all, that's all that happened. Yeah. And then years later, when, on the day I finished Middlesex, I was living in Berlin, and I went to the Academy of, um, American Academy in Berlin for dinner, and there were scholars there and other artists, and there was an art historian there. And I looked across the table, and I seemed to recognize the face. And I, I, I asked her if she went to Brown, and she said she went to Brown, and I realized that this was the obscure object <laughs> um, 20 years later, or even more. And um, I told her that I had, you know, I had a story for her that I was going to tell her as soon as my book came out. And, and I think she lives in Toronto now. <laughs> <It's what laughs> and there she yes, is. And I, I hear so you let's have a hand. Well, I said, how could I be in your book? Because we've never met. Already? Yeah. Oh, OK. So I accused you of extreme marketing. <laughs> anyway, but. Um, my question is, given that I recognize the environment of Brown and the debate between semioticians and the more traditional scholarship, and in a way it's something that continues to play out, but why this book now? Why did you write this book now? I don't know if you have an answer for that. I feel the book is now. Um... I, I don't think there's a huge difference between love affairs in 1980 and 2011, I, I know that cell phones have changed things somewhat, um, and, and there's no internet. But when I, when I read the book in colleges, you know, most of the audience, like the, at least the female part of the audience, they agree that boyfriends are just as lousy now as they, as they were. <laughs> and most of the emotional content is the same. I, I wrote it, I said it in the 80s because I wanted the semiotic battles to be at their fiercest, which I think they were. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more muted now. And also, I wanted to be accurate about the time. And, and it was easier for me to remember the 80s. Uh, I, could, I could possibly set it 2011, but it would have added an unnecessary level of difficulty, um, you know, keeping in mind that I, I was really most interested in the eternal emotional um, verities of my characters and, and not the small little differences of, of technology or maybe the, who, who the president is, et cetera. Like, Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, obscure object. <laughs> She's getting less obscure. I, I finally got to talk to her. And she asked you why you wrote the book. Oh, I yeah. know, I know. Well. Hi. Um, Hi. This is scary, Jeff Fugini, this. Um, I have one question. Yes. Just like really curious. You talk about Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters like related to the marriage plot. Mm -hmm. Which is your favorite marriage plot? My, my favorite one is the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. That's, that's my entry point into it. I was, I'm not an Austenite the way Madeline is. And I, and I like, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great book. A, you know, a woman 
she's, she's, um, she's intelligent and the rich, the rich man, Mr. Touchett, wants to free her from ever having to have a husband or be obligated in that way, so he gives her a huge inheritance, but of course the inheritance is exactly what attracts the wrong, the wrong husband. And she has three different men after her, and that's a, a wonderful book, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. I haven't read the book yet, but I've really enjoyed what you've read. Um, it kind of reminded me of uh, myself and my boyfriend are at around that time. But one of the first questions I have is, uh, how do you know what Madeline might have been thinking throughout this relationship? How do you know from her perspective? It's, it's quite uh, bang on, I'd say. <laughs> Well, a lot of the things she thinks are, are things I thought at the same time. The, the part where she comes into the room thinking that her sincerity will, will be better than strategy and that if she really shows that she's in love and weak, it will be a, a form of strength. That's something a, a male or a female can, can learn from being in relationships. Um, it's true. I, the urinary tract information was <laughs> something you have to find from close observation. Um, okay. But I've, I've been around the block by now. And, okay, you know, all right. I, I, so. I have gone out in the middle of the night to buy cranberry juice a couple of times. All right, very good. <laughs> I'm basically that in the fridge and what's yeah. in it at that right. time. Right. My other question is, in your writings, do you uh, want to give um, a little bit of yourself for posterity, or uh, would you like people to, when you're gone, know that you existed and this is what you thought? Uh, no, I, 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 I just want to write a book that will seize the reader and captivate the reader for as, as long as I can. And I, I find that the only way I can do that is to infuse my material with a, f a fair amount of my own feeling about the material, feeling about life. So you have to find a connection between life and literature to, to, um, to make it feel real to yourself and hopefully real to the, to the reader. Um, other than that, I have no, no thoughts about the reader thinking about me. Just I hope they think about the book, and I'm just concerned with the reading experience of the book and try to work as hard as I can so that it moves fluidly and, and, and uh, intelligibly along. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Hi. Um, I also haven't read the book yet, but uh, I had listened to another interview that you did um, with Terry Gross, mm -hmm. and um, you were talking about how you really loved the marriage plot novels, um, how The Portrait of a Lady was one of your favorite books, and how you wish that you could have written a 19th century novel um, set in that kind of milieu and that environment. Um, but I'm just wondering if you really think the conventions of marriage have changed that much that you couldn't write a marriage plot novel. Um, um, to me, I feel like people do still get married for the same reasons and people are bound in bad relationships. Um, you know, they're not willing to break up families. I don't know if, I don't know if yeah. human nature really changes that much. So I'm just wondering if you it's could true. speak to that. It, it, you, you can still write about marriage. Marriage is still at the center of most of our, our lives, um, but you can't write it as the complete tragedy as you, you could have written in the 19th century. Anna Karenina jumping in front of the train um, is an extre extreme uh, result of divorce. You could, you could write a, a book about it, but it would still seem like this one person um, really, really got upset about her divorce and decided to kill herself. But with Anna Karenina, it almost feels inevitable because of all the things that happen as a result of her divorce. Now, this book, I mean, that I've written is a marriage plot, and it isn't a marriage plot. It, it draws directly from the tradition of the marriage plot and contains some of the elements of the marriage plot. At the same time, it's not averse to modernity, and it deals with people in, with the sexual and political realities we're living in today. So um, marriage isn't gone from our lives. It's certainly not gone from the novel. But uh, I think a real doctrinaire marriage plot can't, can't really be written in our society. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. This is an intimidating way to ask a question. Okay. 
Uh, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about the relationship between, if I understand it, semiotics is the study of signs, mm -hmm. so very surface oriented, and my reading of Victorian literature has led me to think it's very much about manners. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a bit about the relationship between those two surface oriented modes of literature in your work, if there is one? I don't think I can, I'm afraid, because I, I don't... You don't agree with me. I, I don't know. No, <laughs> I, I agree. I think you, I mean, obviously you can use, you can have a semiotic reading of Victorian literature, and plenty of people did. You know, the, the book that Madeline reads, The Mad Woman in the Attic, is that kind of reading. It shows that, that in, in, in those books, if a woman was, was, was mad, I mean, if a woman was, if a woman didn't behave properly in a way, or, or, or didn't conform to the time, she was shut away in, in, in the attic. And they, you know, that, that book sh finds many different instances of this in different Victor pieces of Victorian literature. So you, you, can, you can analyze it that way and see what the codes are. Um, but I was not particularly concerned with that. I, I, was, more of a, I was more of a modernist in college and, and came to my um, love of narrative later on reading Tolstoy. But, but um, the Victorians haven't been a big influence for me. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, on a different note, I was curious what your thoughts are on ebooks and the changing relationship between readers, publishers, booksellers, mm -hmm. authors, and what's actually going to happen to the novel. So, what are your thoughts on this new media? This is the first book I've published where ebooks have really come into it. The last time it was 3% of sales, and now I was told in the last few weeks. Um, at least on Amazon, I don't think total sales, but for Amazon, I think my books are selling two to one eBooks, which is a oh. huge difference. But that, it's not total because there's a lot of print books. And the only people I'm meeting on my book tour are people that have the, the print edition because um, they're coming for signings and buying books. So um, I, I don't know how I feel about it. I think we're all, we're, we're, we're disturbed and compliant about it. I mean, we're, we, we don't know how to oppose it, and yet we aren't entirely happy ab about it. But then we meet people who have read the book in, 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 in the e-book fashion, and they seem, it seems as though they've read the book. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, and, you know, I'm of a certain age. My daughter does both. She's 13. She has a, a nook, and um, she loves the nook and doesn't like the Kindle. And I don't know how, you know, how I feel about it. I'm, I'm worried. I get... My pangs are greatest when I'm in an uh, independent bookstore um, being run by lovely people, and you can feel that they're laying off staff and they're, and they're really having a lot of pressure put on them. And it's hard at that point not to feel um, sympathy for them and to worry not about the loss of the book, printed book, which I don't think is going to go away, but the loss of the bookstore, because bookstores were so important for me um, as, a, as a young person, as a young writer, to go in and, and, and to browse and to find the books that, that matter to me, that I can't imagine a world where the only way I encounter books is on the web reading snippets and, and, and publishing um, jacket copy and things like that. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a peril and, it's, it's, and it worries, I think, all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I have a more general question about writing. I was wondering if you ever go back and read your old works or finished books from years ago, and if your perspective has changed on them, or if you would have done anything differently in writing. I wouldn't have written The Virgin Suicides um, now because I have a daughter, and it would, not have, I would just, it would not be an appealing subject to write about suicidal girls now. When I was a young man, I could be cavalier and, and do that. Mm -hmm. My daughter's now 13 years old, and the there's a line in The Virgin Suicide, Cecilia, the first daughter who tries to commit suicide, is taken to the hospital, and the doctor says, why are you in here, honey? You're not even old, old enough to know how bad life gets. And she replies, obviously, doctor, you've never been a 13-year-old girl. So when I, when I think about that line and I think about my daughter, um, there seems to be an incredible chasm between the two, the two writers, um, or the two, the two people I was at, at those different times. Um, you, grow, you grow out of your books, uh, you grow past them. Each book teaches you wh what the next book is going to be. Um, and you're, you're happy that they exist and you're happy that other people can read them, but you, you do focus on the, on the new work and not very much on the old work. 
Has your daughter read The Virgin Suicides? I won't let her. <laughs> Not yet. Good man. Does she read any of your books? No, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of good stuff for her yet, but she'll, be, she'll have a decent time in college. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, or she'll be horrified. Hi. Hi. Um, just wanted to say, 20 years ago, I probably would have fallen in love with somebody like Leonard, and 20 years later, I'm sad to say, I probably would still. After, <laughs> <laughs> after reading the depiction of that character, I was just so awestruck by how deeply you seem to understand his mental illness. Did you have to immerse yourself deeply in that world to get there? Actually not. I mean, he, Leonard really comes from stories mm -hmm. such as you're saying. Women have told me about boyfriends that they've had who were manic depressive or just extremely moody and, and, and sometimes those, those men made such huge impressions on the women that the women never forgot them. So that was where, his, that's where the idea for him, him came. And I needed to know what manic depression was, so I, I read up on it to find out what the behaviors were that are, that are associated with it. And I learned um, just, the, just the basics um, that, that you would maybe take great physical risks or financial risks in mania, um, that you might wear strange clothing. When he has the, the hunter's vest on in the, the part I read, that's the first sign that he's, that he's getting manic because he's, he has this attachment to this bright orange vest. Things like that I, I learned. Um, but as I, as I wrote his, his, his descent or ascent in, into mania, I just had to imagine what it would, what it would be like to, to have your brain operating um, at, at, at such a capacity where it's a, a kind of insanity, but it, but it feels like ecstasy. Um, so I, you, you, I, just had to, I just had to imagine what, what it was. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Oops. Um, first of all, uh, I've, I've just written a book, Lost and Found in London, and I have to admit it's on Amazon. And that's very handy for international sales, but here in Toronto, I've stuck strictly with the independent bookstores, and they have been so welcoming so we re to a new writer. So we really do have to support them. But my question is, I started writing this book as a memoir and um, as fact, and my, my characters, which were people, were me and people I knew, kept getting away from me. So I'm now calling it fact and fiction, faction. And I'm just wondering if you have the same experience. You mentioned not being able to write about yourself. Mm -hmm. But the way that, that your characters just take on a life of their own. I mean, my characters, as I said, were real. But they, even then, they... Well, see, you're, an on, you're, a, you're that very rare thing, an, an honest memoir writer. <laughs> because you realize, as you try to describe yourself and people you know, yeah. that it's almost impossible to get the, the, the truth down on the page. That's what, why the novel was invented. It, it was a way to, to write about life and, and have actual truth in a book. Because if you make it up, even if part of it is, comes from your life, whatever happens in the book really happened. If you try to remember a conversation you had when you were 10, as so many memoirs do, and, and, and they report it you know, as, as though they remember exactly what their mother said when they were six. Um, and they don't say that, that they're embellishing it or you know, they even admit that, to the best of my recollection, this is what it was like. I think, I think you've, you've deluded yourself, um, and you're not actually telling the, the truth at all. So I would urge you to just go whole hog and call it fiction, and everyone will be very happy. People, <laughs> people are perfectly happy to, to, read, to read novels. Um, they'll, they'll ask you how autobiographical it is, and part of it will be autobiographical, and that's <laughs> perfectly valid. But on the other hand, it's not, you know, you don't, you're not tyrannized by some, some idea of what, what, what really happened. Uh, and well, that can be a problem. I say 70-30. 70% 70 70 fact, 30% mm. fiction. Mm -hmm. And people seem to be happy well, with that mix. <laughs> it, de it depends on the writer. I think Saul Bellow is almost 70-30, 80-20. Mm -hmm. um, other people are 50-50 and, 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 and less. Um, and I actually put a warning on the copyright page that mm -hmm. um, the, real, the real experiences have been enhanced yeah. to make well, the that's, story flow. That's good. I think that's, you know, I, I, I approve that. Proof of that. <laughs> I'm proud of that. Thank Good. you. Um, I want to thank Jeffrey Eugenides for being such a wonderful writer and for being so generous with his time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.